Greetings gamers, today we're talking about maths in D&D. No, 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 don't click away, this is going to be a useful video, I promise. Greetings gamers, I'm Anto and I've been playing tabletop games for almost 20 years now. On this channel I make videos on how to be a better dungeon master, build deeper worlds and decode the core mechanics of D&D 5e. So if you're new here make sure to subscribe for more videos just like this. In today's video we're talking about the core mathematics behind D&D 5e. Now to some of you the things we're going to cover in this video are going to be blindingly obvious and you won't get anything from this. In which case feel free to skip this video, check out my recent video on making cults and religions instead maybe. But this video is for the new dungeon master or the DM who isn't super familiar with the core maths behind the game. My goal with this video is to empower you to tinker and change rules and game elements by giving you a solid understanding of the fundamental rules that you're interacting with when you change something. If you know how it works, you'll know how to break it in the right way in the future. So to get started, the first thing we need to understand is the powerhouse of D&D, the Mitochond wait, the D20. The humble D20 is so important, it has a whole family of games named after it, the D20 systems. But why a D20? Why not a D8 or a D12 or a coin that you flip to see if you succeed or fail? Plenty of systems use other dice that aren't D20 for their core mechanics, but the D20 is kind of the Goldilocks dice. It has enough faces to offer a satisfying amount of variance, but not so many that the difference between any two numbers is inconsequential. If D&D used a D100 system, for example, it would still work exactly the same in a lot of ways. But the problem with a D100 is that you either have to make your mechanics so granular that the difference between a 61 and a 62 is significant enough to matter, or you're breaking your mechanics into bands of numbers. In which case, why not use a dice with fewer faces? Now, some games do have that level of granularity where a D100 is the best option, but 5e is focused on being simple and easy to understand, so a D20 works much better than a D100 ever would. A D20 has 20 sides, obviously, but that means that it fits into a 100 perfectly. Each side represents a 5% chunk. This is the foundation that the maths of D&D 5e is built on. By the end of this video, I don't want you to just think in terms of D&D maths. I want to help wire your brain to think in 5%. This and basically everything else in 5e's core design philosophy comes together in a system called bounded accuracy. Now, bounded accuracy is, in my opinion, one of 5e's biggest strengths. Once you wrap your head around it and understand the system, it gives you so much freedom as a dungeon master, despite being functionally limiting to your options. In earlier editions of the game, for example, like 3.5, banded accuracy wasn't a thing, and the theoretical cap on your character's numbers was stupidly high, if not non-existent. In games like Pathfinder, which is the system I was running for years, it wasn't impossible for a character to have an AC of 22 plus at level three. And once you get to the higher levels in games like that, armor classes above 40 are hardly rare. Now the problem with these systems is sometimes called the treadmill effect. The world levels in response to the players, and as the players level up their stats, the world levels up with them. Monsters' ACs rise as the players to hit bonus climbs higher and higher, with no real limit on any of these numbers. 5th edition fixes this by putting a limit on how high your numbers can go. In 5e, your core stats typically can't go above a 20, and the stats of the monsters typically can't go above a 31. This is the core philosophy of banded accuracy, as it places a spectrum that every player and monster has to fall on. And banded accuracy facilitates a couple of things that I really love about 5th edition. Firstly, it means that you can set a difficulty class and you don't need to change it as your players level up. A door that needs a DC 17 check to bypass will get easier to open as the players level up, but it'll never get so easy that putting it in front of them becomes worthless. A DC 15 check to jump across a chasm will get easier as the players level up, but it will always carry a legitimate danger of failure and one of the players might roll low and fall into the chasm. Compare this to a system like Pathfinder, where it's possible to have plus 20 bonus in a skill, meaning that non-magical threats pose no real challenge unless you're using homebrew critical fails and successes with your skills. The second reason I like banded accuracy is because it means monsters of all challenge ratings will always have some use on the battlefield which means the range of monsters you can use at higher levels is much greater. A monster with an AC of 18 is going to be very difficult to hit at level 1, 
but even when your players get to level 20, there's still a chance they won't hit AC 18, even discounting their natural ones. And the reverse is true. Players AC doesn't tend to get much above 20, which means everything, no matter what their challenge rating is, will always have a chance of hitting them. In 3.5 and its successes, if you put a goblin against a level 20 player, the goblin could only score a hit on a critical most of the time, which means it was practically worthless. But in 5e, that 1 4th CR goblin will still hit even the most armoured player about 25% of the time. Now, for some people, this is a shortcoming of banded accuracy. They don't want their level 20 characters to be able to be hit by something like a goblin. But just because the goblin hits your level 20 character doesn't mean they do enough damage to make any meaningful difference to them. It just means they can make their blow actually land. So banded accuracy gives you this spectrum that you'll always fall on in terms of how easy or difficult things are to achieve. And I think that's actually why we haven't seen the numerous monster manuals from Wizards of the Coast, like we've seen from Paizo. They've instead focused on things like Tome of Foes, because all the monsters can be used at all levels of play, so you don't need to manufacture so much variety at each tier to keep things genuinely interesting. Now, if you want to wield the maths of D&D like a weapon, you need to understand how to calculate the percentages of success and failure with dice. As I said earlier, the D20 is great for this because each face is worth 5%, meaning you have a 5% chance of rolling any specific number on a D20. Now, to calculate the odds of success, we need to know our target number. To keep things nice and simple, we will go with 10, a nice easy number. Now your instincts might tell you that you have a 50% chance of hitting a 10 or above on a d20, 10 is half of 20 after all, but that isn't the case because D&D uses a meet or beat system meaning you hit on a 10 or higher and you need to factor that 10 in when calculating your percentages. So counting up on our fingers we hit on a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, meaning we have 11 numbers that equal success on this roll. 11 multiplied by five is 55. So the odds of getting a 10 or higher on a d20 are 55%. This is something that trips up a lot of new players and dungeon masters because it can seem like there's a kind of hidden 5% there. It's a small difference, but it is a significant one because it means whenever you're making something like a death save, you're more likely to succeed than you are to fail, which is a big deal when it comes to core design philosophy. Things start to change slightly when we start adding bonuses and penalties, but the process is still largely the same. Let's take that target number of 10 once again. We know that rolling just a straight d20, we have a 55% chance of success with a DC of 10. But what if we have some kind of bonus? Well, it will increase our chances of success in relation to that bonus. A bonus of plus two means we're 10% more likely to hit, meaning a success chance of 65%, whereas a plus five bonus gives us an extra 25% chance to hit, meaning our success chance goes up to 80%. To make this easier to understand, I've made a visual table that plots bonuses to the roll on the left against the target number along the top, giving you the chance for success at any given roll. Now, as you can see on the table, the numbers only ever go as high as 95 or as low as 5%. And that's because of critical rolls. No, not that critical roll. D&D uses the critical system, where when making an attack roll, a result of 1 is always a miss, and a result of 20 is always a hit. As I mentioned when talking about bounded accuracy, this means that every creature always has a chance to hit another creature. These critical rolls don't apply to ability and skill rolls, so those 95 and 5% chances become 100 or 0% chances, and your players don't actually need to roll for those. The other major thing to know about the maths behind 5e is how advantage and disadvantage impact your chance of success. When you have advantage, you roll two dice and choose the highest to be your result, which is obviously a good thing, but how good is it? To find out, I made another table which takes advantage into account. You can see here that a level one character who has a total to hit bonus of plus five, trying to hit an AC 14, usually has a 60% chance to hit. Now with advantage, that jumps to a whopping 84%. But how do we arrive at these numbers? Well, with advantage, what you're doing is you're rolling two dice and you're keeping the highest. So the way we work out that percentage chance is by multiplying the miss percentage by itself and taking that number away from 100. 
the miss percent chance in this example is 40%. So the easiest way to do this is multiply 40 by 40%, 40 which gives you 16. That 16 is the new miss percentage. Take that away from 100 and we get an 84% chance to hit. To work out disadvantage, we need to multiply our hit chance by itself. So a bonus of plus five versus a target of 14. Our hit chance is 60%. So 60 multiplied by 60% equals 36%. So hopefully you can see how advantage and disadvantage have a huge impact on your chances of success or failure, much more so than a flat two modifier would, for example. But what's the real in-game benefit to knowing this? How can knowing the maths behind the game make you a better dungeon master? Well, by understanding the core maths behind 5e, you'll know exactly how any changes you make are going to impact the game in real terms. Let's say your players are level 1 with a plus 5 bonus, and you want to make a monster more challenging, so you decide to bump the AC of the monster up from 14 to 16. Now this means that the player's chances of hitting the monster just went from 60% down to 50%, which means they're no longer hitting more than half the time. This is important to the psychology of the players, because even though they're still missing only half the time, it's going to feel like they're missing a lot more. Players might have to wait 10 to 15 minutes before their turn, and if they make a single attack and miss, half the time, they might only score one or two hits in the course of a night, and that's just not fun for the players. In my opinion, it's far better to keep the monster's AC at 14, and instead give it more hit points. You're still making the monster more survivable, but the players feel like they're actually making progress against the monster instead of spending the night missing their attacks. Now, as the players level up, you can start adding extra AC to your monsters. If you want to throw really low level monsters at a high level party, giving them access to shields or better armor that bump up their AC, make them a little harder to hit without changing their HP, is a really good way to go. Your players are going to have a harder time hitting them, which means they stick around in the fight a little bit longer, but you're not adjusting the HP and creating this disconnect in the player's brain where they go, at level one, it was taken as this much damage to kill this thing. Now it's taken as four times as much. That doesn't make any sense. But if you say to them they're wearing heavier armor than any you fought before, that makes logical sense as to why it's taking the players longer to kill them now than it might have done four or five levels ago. Now, a great example of how understanding the effects of advantage in particular can affect your game is the flanking rule. The optional flanking rules on page 251 of the DMG state that when a character and one of their allies are on opposite sides of an enemy, they both get advantage on their attacks. The purpose of this rule makes a lot of sense. Defending yourself from two fronts is a difficult task, and the players gaining some kind of bonus for their tactical position seems fair. But advantage grants the player a bonus that's almost the same as a plus five, which you might think is too high. I certainly do. So instead, you might choose to go with the flat plus two bonus for flanking. It's a 10% increase on the chance to hit, which is still significant, but it's not nearly as drastic as advantage. The tables I have made, which I will link below for you to use, are also incredibly useful to get an idea of what is an appropriate challenge for your players as they progress through the campaign. It allows you to very quickly and easily identify if something is too easy or too hard to hit or accomplish. I really hope this video has been enlightening and it's empowered you to make some tweaks to the rules, confident you understand how they will impact the game. I have a whole playlist of DM tip videos to help make you a better dungeon master, which you can find right there. And thanks to Pandalf the Red over on Discord for double checking my maths on this one. But until next time, happy gaming.